list of people who are supporting this. Um, I'm going to hand over the, the book. What do I want to say? I, there's. I guess I do want to say something. Uh, another, another different kind of uh, program that I have been involved in a lot is uh, we're showing this film and it's called uh, that they all made. It's called Dancing with the Cannibal Giant, New Stories for the Great Transition. Um, and it's really, when we think of the title of this series, which is the Soil Series, Grassroots for the Climate Emergency, the work I'm doing in another sphere, another sort of set of programs that actually just showed last night in Chelsea, brought it to the in Chelsea, they just opened up a new community arts center um, and presented there. Um, and the film really gets, the goal of the film and the program that follows it is to really get at the connection or to explore the connection, both as an individual and collectively, whoever's in the room at that time, about the crisis that you really think of. Oh. People can't what? hear too well, Chris. It's not you. Oh. No, no, I know, but I'm, the, the problem is that I'm terrible with the mic. Well, then we the What's the problem? <laughs> I like I can oh, still on a mic. <laughs> um, ah, okay. This is the second time you threw me a curve on my, my, my you know, I, I, always, I always think that the, the last time I was here and I was um, in the middle of saying something, Beth, Beth said, get the mic. Um, and I got the mic, but of course, the little, you know, when the computer does the little spinning circle, <laughs> it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of like, okay, where was I? It's gonna come up at some point. Anyway, I, I, all, all I really want to say is um, if anybody is really interested, um, I am promoting this in, in kitchens, around kitchen tables, in community spaces, in libraries. Um, eight people, eight to 20 is what I say is ideal because then we can sit in a circle and we can share for 45 minutes. Um, and we talk about both our pain for the world and what, what we see and feel happening, but also we talk about how do we get, how do we get over that, for some people, you know, I call it a hump, our, you know, our challenge individually and collectively to actually vastly shift the way we live and relate to the world. Um, the reason that I bring it up is it was so beautiful last night, um, and a whole bunch of people in Chelsea, um, I think, got inspired, and some people said, you know, I'm, you know, making commitments to really sort of do things in their communities. So it's that's that's a long introduction, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you got the mic. <laughs> I have the mic. Um, so, so uh, anyway, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm grateful we've gotten to num program number six, supposedly the end of the series, but I'm going to hand it over to Kat for everything from here on. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, so, yes, this was going to be the end of the series, um, but we've decided we can't stop. So, we're going to, um, May 8th, mark your calendars on May 8th, we're going to do this again. No speakers. We'll be here for three hours, and the goal is to plug people in and have more time for the discussion in small and large groups uh, for everything that we've been learning about over the past six, five events, and then this one being the sixth. Um, so, I'm Kat Buxton. Pot, potluck. Oh, oh yes, May 8th is going to be a potluck. Black Crim will not be no, cooking no for us. No lovely spread. Um, and having said that, Black Crim has prepared all of the food for us this evening. Please help yourself. <laughs> Black Crim.
Lutheran Tavern is located right up the street here in Randolph, so check them out. It's a really sweet little place. Um, they do really good work all the time, not just for us. Um, so, a few things before we get to our program. Um, we do send out very detailed notes for every single event. Uh, Lauren, here, is taking notes, and she's been taking them for all five events so far. Um, if you would like to see those notes, we also include links to the slides. They um, also include notes that I take on the wall, links to organizations and events that have been mentioned. We, we really keep track of everything. If you want those, please make sure that I get your email address on the yellow piece of paper, and please have mercy on me and write neatly so that I don't have to try and figure out what you wrote. Um, so tonight we are gonna draw the raffle. So if you haven't gotten a raffle ticket, you should have gotten one when you came in the door just for being here, you get one. If you wanna buy any more of them, they're $5 a piece tonight after the program. And before the discussion, we are gonna call the raffle for the winner of seven books uh, by four authors, uh, all women, three from Vermont, one from New Hampshire, two are here this evening, Jan Lambert and Judith Schwartz. And Grace, three are here this evening. So the only author who's not here this evening is Dee Dee Pursehouse. The rest of our authors are here in the house um, and have books for sale. Judith also um, just hot off the presses today is the paperback copy of Water in Plain Sight. So this is a big deal. Um, she brought lots of books, so please buy them. Um, and, and Jan has lots of books, so please buy those. <laughs> And even if Grace didn't bring her books with you, you could still buy those, and I encourage you to do that. Um, so we also are accepting further donations for our work. It costs a lot of money to put these events on. I've put in, I don't know, 10 million hours. Um, and I love it, it's really fun, but if you wanna give us some money, we really appreciate that because it helps us to continue to do this work and eat. Um, and uh, we have a survey, so please, please, please take the survey. It's a paper copy on the table. Um, those surveys help us to get more money from the funders that you saw on the screen behind me. These are some of the organizations. I've also written a whole bunch of grants, and so those grantors want to see that you're enjoying yourselves or not. They just want to know what you think. So please um, fill that out. So tonight, um, we have a packed program. We have four speakers that have about seven minutes each to give you a whole lot of information. So again, I encourage you to sign up for the notes if you want to get links to all of the things they're talking about. Uh, and then we're gonna get into a circle and talk. And that's how we run these events and they've been running really well, so I hope you enjoy that too. Our speakers tonight are Judith Schwartz, Henry Swayze, Jan Lambert, and Carl Tiedemann. Carl is from Soil for Climate, and they're each gonna talk a little bit. I hope you're gonna talk a little bit about, okay, good. So, <laughs> good. Uh, they're gonna talk a little bit. And so I'm gonna pass it right over to Judith to get us started. And, um, yeah, Judith. Thank you. Um, so up till now, this series has given us a lot of angles on soil, including apparently soil as a metaphor for community, a really good metaphor actually. And here we're going to focus on water, as soil and water are intrinsically connected. Another thing is that um, whether overtly or indirectly, this whole series is also about climate and the topic of water is really relevant here because water and climate are also connected. And what inspired me to focus on water for as long as I did is that I noticed that whenever water and climate are discussed together, the conversation only goes one way, meaning that it's calling attention, people are calling attention to the impact that climate change will have on water sources throughout the world. But what's equally important is the effect that the water cycle has on climate. And I know that other speakers are going to talk about this, but I just wanted to put that out there. So water challenges are, are really becoming kind of prevalent and prominent and in our face, our faces, um, a lot. 
And not, it's not always that land is connected with, with the, the water situation, but we can't really talk about water unless we're also talking about land and land management, which means how we treat the soil. To a large extent, how we're able to meet these challenges, whether an epic flood means million in disaster relief, or whether a river stays on its banks, turns on how we manage this, our soil. And why is that? Because as this, as this series has emphasized, living carbon-rich soil is a sponge. And I don't know if you've heard the statistic yet, but every 1% increase in soil organic carbon represents an additional 20,000 gallons of water per acre that can be held on the land. And that is a huge, huge amount in terms of resilience to floods because all that water can be held, but also allows you to last just that much longer between irrigations and withstand droughts. When people think of water infrastructure, they, this is generally, generally what they mean. This lovely little bit of work here, this is the LA River. It's a 51 mile concrete corridor that ch channels rainwater out of the city and dumps it, pollutants and all, into the ocean. My colleague Brock Dahlman calls this the pipe shed as opposed to a watershed, which I think is an effective way of coming attention to the disconnection between water and the land. So let's rethink water infrastructure. Maybe we can think of soil as our water infrastructure. This can work on many levels. First, there's the surface of the ground. If soil lacks plant cover, whenever it rains, it seals over and water streams away, carrying away precious topsoil along with whatever pollutants are in its path. With bare ground, falling raindrops batter the soil. I know that we think of rain as mild and nourishing, but seen under the microscope, rain striking bare earth is a kind of violence. Particles flying upwards like shards of glass, leaving empty craters. Soil covered by plants or mulch is sheltered. On a zoom lens level, we can see water infrastructure in the soil aggregate, where, as we've learned, so much happens. Well aggregated soil has pore spaces for water to linger and filter through, replenishing underground water stores. What we now see as water problems, perhaps we can understand them as a failure to keep water in the ground problems. And here in Vermont, as in everywhere, we can address this by tending soil, making sure it doesn't degrade to lifeless dirt. When people talk about water, it tends to be water as a noun, as something bounded by place, something that you have or I have and maybe we fight over. I like to think of water as a verb, and I believe this is a crucial understanding for climate as water processes, meaning the movement of water across the landscape and also through the atmosphere, is a tremendous conveyor of heat. I mean, if we pause to ask the question, how does the Earth manage heat, we would find the answer in water-based processes, but this tends not to come up in discussions of climate. Other speakers will be offering insights on the kinds of dynamics in nature that move and modulate water, but I wanna hover for a moment on one water process that connects the soil and the sky and has a huge impact on climate regulation, and that is transpiration, the upward <coughs> movement of water through plants. This is a huge force in nature. I interviewed Brazilian ecologist Antonio Nobre, and he point he wrote this amazing document. It really, it really is stunning. Not only does it specify what is going on in the Amazon region, but also talks about water, forest, forest climate dynamics. <clears throat> he points out that the collective transpiration in the Amazon rainforest creates a vertical river that contains five times the amount of moisture of the Amazon River itself. What's important to keep in mind is that this is a cooling mechanism, transforming solar heat into latent heat suspended in vapor, as opposed to sensible heat or heat you can feel, like a hot sidewalk. Healthy soil supports plants and robust plants help build soil. 
all of which <laughs> supports climate regulation. In fact, in my reporting on soil and water, one thing has struck me, and that is the extent to which plants are running the show. I didn't expect to come to that notion, but that's kind of where it's led. Um, there's a Spanish meteorologist, climatologist, fascinating guy that um, I spent time with on a reporting trip. And he, the way he puts it is, vegetation is the midwife of precipitation. <laughs> and hey, I've got another for you. I'll leave you with a quote from Australian farmer, author, Peter Andrews, which says so much in just a few words. In fact, I realize it's basically a haiku. All right, here it is. Plants manage water, and in managing water, they are managing heat. Way back, about a zillion years ago, when I wrote Cows Save the Planet, my book on soil, I came up with a bumper sticker version of what we need to do to address climate change. And that was oxidize less, photosynthesize more. <laughs> and over the past several years, I and many others have been filling in that picture a lot and including a lot more nuances. But essentially, that kind of sums it up. And water, as well as enhancing, enhancing the relationship between water and soil, is a really big part of that. And so, we will move on to Henry. Am I on this mic? Yes, I can hear myself. Uh, so I'm, I'm Henry Swayze, and a member of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And just curiosity, how many, how many members here? Woo. So how many of you are, you, are you members because you started coming to the series? How many new members? One. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, we're glad we got you. <laughs> uh, So, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about cooling the planet. Um, uh, we've already gotten set up for that <laughs> very nicely, um, and and we all ask ourselves this question: What do we need to fix climate change? Um, and at least most of us, I imagine. Uh, and it's pretty daunting. Um, I now believe that we actually have to focus on cooling uh, while we're doing everything else. Uh, that without the cooling component, uh, we, won't, um, we won't win the battle. And this, uh, this gentleman, Walter Yenna, Australian uh, plant and soil scientist, uh, he really uh, transformed my thinking from thinking that we had to sequester carbon in order to uh, fix climate change to thinking that we, uh, that we have to actually jump in and cool the planet now. So I have really bad news and really good news. Oops. And we'll do the bad news first. Uh, so the World Health Organization uh, estimates that 250,000 people will die each year as uh, a result of global warming. Uh, that's in the, uh, the 2030 dash maybe 2050 time zone. Um, that's equal to 18.8 um, uh, Vegas uh, Vegas <laughs> shootings, that, that night, nightclub outdoor uh, shoot up everybody you can session, 18 a day. That's what that sort of number translates into. And the, the, uh, the International um, Panel on Climate Change says we only have about 10 to 15 years time frame to actually start to cool the planet. We actually have to flatten that temperature curve down. 
so we all have thought that turning a fossil fuel off uh, was the answer, and I certainly was on board with that for a number of years. Um, and I still am, but it's not the answer, I don't think. Uh, so the question is, uh, do you know uh, what would happen if we could grab hold the big switch and at midnight tonight just shut off all fossil fuel? What would happen to our temperature? Keep going. It keep heating up. And it would, it would go up um, uh, for as much as another 100 years. Uh, we've already stored a lot of CO2 uh, in the environment. And it needs to get pulled out before you actually get a downward trend. Time's limited. Uh, as that temperature rises, we start getting positive feedback loops. You people probably all have heard about these horror stories. <laughs> and those positive feedback loops uh, will give us runaway warming, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we won't recognize the Earth. Uh, this is the this is temperature. What's been happening? And this, I think, finished in, in, um, in 17. Uh, but this curve is not only going up, the red line is the average, not only going up for the temperature, but it's actually getting steeper going up. So right now, we're not doing it. So, OK, I've done that one. We sequester carbon. When do we start getting cooling? Um, and it takes, if, if we were to sequester carbon really fast, we might be able to get done in 20 years, start, start getting cooling out of that sequestering. We'd certainly make it so the temperature didn't rise as fast. Um, now, some very good news. So now we're going to look at the power of natural systems. Uh, and so the first component here is to realize that when the sun shines on bare surfaces, whether that's a plowed field, an asphalt driveway, a, uh, uh, a roof, uh, that surface gets hot. And that heat's radiated out at ground level. And that ground level radiation has to go somewhere. And it goes up and tries to get back to space. So that's heat. That's sunlight in and energy. and radiant heat, <coughs> infrared heat, trying to find its way back out. It has a hard time doing that because we have micro hazes and we've got uh, humidity in the air and there's a lot of feet of climate or of air between the ground and space. But space is cold and it's ready to absorb that if we send it there. So that, that bare, if you look at it from a field point of view, that bare field is likely to be 40 to 50 degrees warmer than the ground under a tree or under a, a plant. Enormous difference. And uh, part of that is, as Judith said, it's because we're getting evaporation from the, from the tree uh, or from the plant. We are capturing that heat and sending it up. And, uh, and if we were to do that, um, uh, cover every, all the bare surfaces with actively growing plants, not all dead ones, but actively growing plants, longer the grazing season or longer the, the growth season, the, the better. We actually could cool the planet faster than greenhouse gases are currently warming. So that alone would offset all the warming that's currently going on, and it would draw down carbon as well. Uh, now, for some more good news, we do the water cycle, since this is a water evening. And, um, uh, and that water cycle uh, is driven by that solar heat coming in, uh, getting evaporation at ground level, getting evaporation from plants, and being sent up to clouds. Um, not reading my notes. 
So there is the answer to the question I was going to ask you, <laughs> which is um, uh, how much heat do you think greenhouse gases are, are actually trapping? Heat in that doesn't escape. And, and for those of you who are paying any attention, uh, that number is 4%. Um, and uh, and then we'll go on to, uh, if we're looking at that water cycle, how much heat is, is being moved around by that water cycle, that evaporation and raindrop formation cycle? Anyone want to take a guess at that one without, before I show it to you? 60 percent, I hear. 95, but that's very good. So 94 <laughs> percent. Um, and so why are we spending so much time thinking about the the greenhouse gas piece of this and not paying attention to to that water cycle and what it can drive? Uh, in there. Yeah. In there. All right. So let's just look at what happens there. Uh, as as Jan said, we One get, minute. Okay. We we get evaporation at ground level, goes up to clouds, but it gets formed into a raindrop. Uh, that heat is released. It's closer to space, so more heat escapes than if it just the heat had stayed at ground level. So it's a, it's a pump to, to throw heat back into space. <clears throat> so we need a raindrop to do that, and those raindrops require a, um, a hydroscopic nuclei, something for the raindrop to form around, and those hydroscopic nuclei in part are coming from bacteria that live on the surface of plants. So if we get plants growing, we will get more raindrop formation as well as the cooling that comes from the shading and from uh, um, uh, transporting heat from the ground up to cloud level. So I think that with that, we will roll it on to Jan. Let her tell you some more about it. That was awesome. Okay, so before I start in on my slides, I just want to point out that I have a table full of stuff here, and I'm hoping to give away a lot of it tonight, as well as hopefully sell a few books. But the main thing is to get the information out there. And um, I'm an editor and a writer, so and I'm also started an online library at our new organization called Voices of Water for Climate. So information is my thing. And uh, I've got plenty of it to offer, and I'm just barely getting a chance to just introduce you to it now. So please take a look at the stuff on the table later. Um, so uh, what Henry said about the water cycle is very important, and there's even more great things about restoring water cycles. Uh, this is something I've been studying intensely for the last few years. Um, water cycles act directly on the climate as well. By restoring the water cycle, um, you can restore climate. And this book was written by Michael Kropchik in Slovakia. It's called Water for the Recovery of the Climate, a New Water Paradigm. You can download it for free from our website. Um, and it's, it's all about what he calls the new water paradigm, which um, also is located in a new publication called the Wat Valley Water Journal, which we just started last month. And on the second page of it, uh, there's a chart describing what the new water paradigm is all about. And it just, it just starts out by saying, the, oh, the water on land, the old water paradigm, water on land does not influence global warming. The new water paradigm is an important factor in global warming, maybe the change in the water cycle caused by drying and sub subsequent warming of continents your human activity, that's very important. Um, just wanted to, to let you know there's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, serious research is being done, particularly in Europe. I have a, 
a scholarly paper called The Indirect and Direct Thermodynamic Effects of Wetlands, Ecosystems, and Climate. It's all about the extreme importance of evapotranspiration, which is a combination of uh, evaporation from plants and then evaporation from the land itself or water bodies. Um, the statement of this is, we argue that persisting with the dogma of climate change caused by the greenhouse effect alone results in society ignoring the most important functions of natural vegetation manifest through their direct effect on climate and water cycling. Um, this, is, this is a very scientific uh, study here and it gets into, uh, depending on how technically um, you want to get into it. It's just a lot of really good reading. But I'm going to lighten things up a little bit by um, just getting into, based on um, the, the vast importance of wetlands, um, how many of you realize um, how important beavers are to wetlands? Great. <laughs> Um, wetlands, they've been proven that they, they perform so many functions. I'm sure you realize that they hold water in, they help prevent flooding, they help prevent drought, um, two sides of the same coin. Um, they also help the water cycle. And the water cycle can be seen as a direct effect, a direct beneficial effect on climate. Water cycles are climate, I mean, <laughs> Climate is just a, an average of, of uh, weather, which in weather is caused by water cycles. And, and it's already been mentioned about the heat effect on the land when you don't have water and you have bare land. Well, the same thing can be said by draining water <coughs> off the land rapidly. We're sending it straight into the rivers. You saw that LA River, which is draining it directly to the sea. So all that water, nature intended to be soaked into the land and being transpired to plants, which in turn causes more clouds, which in turn causes more rain. Now, it's not that well known that much of uh, regional climate is actually land-based. In other words, uh, something like 10% of the atmospheric water just keeps getting recycled around and around from the land. And so what happens when you keep draining the water off of the land and, and putting it directly into streams, it runs down to the ocean without getting a chance to be part of the water cycle. And, and that's a, on top of the fact, as Judy mentioned, it, it, it exacerbates drought and flooding. It's, it's just, it's really easy to address that. And, but the fact is, the way we humans are managing our water, we're just wasting it. We're treating it as a waste product, particularly in urban areas and along uh, transportation corridors. So wetlands are just so important, and I've, I've become very interested in, in uh, beavers. So I'm going to, how many more minutes do I have? Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, so we've already talked about water cycles. And uh, I want to emphasize what we call the small water cycle, which is the same as a land-based water cycle, which really doesn't get much attention at all. And evapotranspiration, it's just, it's in high gear in wetlands. It's, it's important everywhere. It's important for forests, but wetlands are just, obviously, they're just this incredible source of evapotranspiration. And you can see the mist rising off these wetlands. That's, that's, um, that's the water cycle. That's the small water cycle in action. And these wetlands here were created and maintained by beavers. So beavers are incredibly useful animals. They, sometimes people don't like them because they cut down the trees. <laughs> but um, they do so much more good than harm. And the thing that I want to, I don't have very long to get into this, but they, they this is a wetland that was created by a beaver near my property. And um, of course they host a lot of other wildlife as well. They, they create wildlife habitat for many, many other species. I mean, it's just, they are just, they are, they are the center, really, of life. Um, this is a woman in, near Brattleboro named Patty Smith who 
and introduced me to some beaver friends of hers. She's made friends with beavers. She's a beaver whisperer. <laughs> and uh, I got to visit her one evening, and here came Georgia to get um, an apple tree. And um, she's been, she's a director of the Bonneville Environmental Center down there in Brattleboro. And she's been studying these beavers for 10 years. One of them is getting quite elderly. So anyway, they, they came up and I, I just went from zero to 60 that night on my knowledge of beavers. I had heard that they um, make these piles called scent mounds with their castor glands to mark their territory. Well, George came up um, and he came up and, and he was two feet away from me. And George is the beaver? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, <Did you> know? <laughs> and it's George and, and Willow is his wife. Okay. <laughs> um, George came up and he was a few feet away from me and he was there in the water and he started pushing this dirt at me out of the water and he just got it up on the land and he patted it out and he turned around. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess George just built me a scent mound. I guess I, yeah. And Patty says, oh, you've got to get down there and smell it. You know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it smells like woodsman's bug dope. Yeah. Yeah. And, so anyway, that was just really a turning point for me, uh, meeting a beaver personally and just seeing, you know, the, there's the two of them together. Um, actually, uh, Willow lost one eye. Uh, she's the one on the right with a piece of apple. Um, Patty is a wildlife rehabilitator and um, she was able to treat Willow's eye infection. She was able to save one of her eyes and that she's, she's got such a rapport with this these beavers, she was able actually to put ointment in their eyes. And uh, so the other thing I've got to get into is about Skip Lyle. Now uh, the main, I mean, most people are in favor of beavers, but there's a lot of beavers being killed in Vermont, and your town has probably got a road crew that goes down and gets rid of all the beavers they can because they're so afraid they're gonna flood the roads. Well, that, that's, a, that's almost entirely unnecessary because um, that's Skip Lyle there. Skip Lyle at Rapid Vermont is world renowned for inventing the beaver deceiver. And he's shown on his property that you can live in, in harmony with beavers. And um, here he's cured a flooded road. Um, and he, he makes it so the beavers and humans can live together. Um, he just did a, a project down in Marlboro, Vermont. I just particularly want to point out, he did it this spring, where he actually improved things. He made everybody happy because they, they had drained this fire pond because it was flooding the road. But then they lost their fire pond because the beavers weren't there to keep the pond going. So Skip brought the, he, he came in and he built one of his beaver deceivers. And I've got all kinds of stuff about it if you want to talk about it. Um, and so he brought in his beaver deceiver, and not only that, but he built a platform out on the pond. And he's got it so calibrated that the pond is going to rise to a certain level and no more. And so now the fire department can come and they can bring their fire truck there and go out on this nicely constructed wooden deck and get the water they need. So everybody's happy. It, it really is very harmonious. And I want to offer harmonious solutions. What was his name again? Skip Lyle, and I, he's got, I've got brochures up here. Uh, afterwards, we can uh, talk all about it. But I guess it's um, time for Carl to talk about holistic grazing. Is that what you're talking about? Oh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Carl, you're not using He's not using slides. You got the light? Oh, okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Carl, and I'm co founder of Zorn for Climate. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in Vermont. 
Um, I highly encourage you to join the Vermont Healthy Soil Coalition. And uh, as well, if you use Facebook, I encourage you to join Soil for Climate. We have nearly 11,000 members from uh, more than 100 countries around the world. It's a great resource for keeping current with the latest science, uh, videos, articles, and so forth. Um, all of us have taken a journey to be here tonight, and that journey has involved learning that responding to climate change is more than about just cutting greenhouse gases. There's so much more that we need to do in the ways that we manage uh, land and, and water. Um, one of the important ways that's come out during the series is holistic planned grazing. Uh, cows and have been getting a, a terrible rap, uh, but thanks to the um, disruptive biological innovation of Alan Savory, a wildlife biologist, We've learned now how to manage animals, even in some of the most challenging climates around the world, in a way that is beneficial uh, by emulating the impact that the wild herds have had through their coevolution with grasslands over approximately the past 40 million years in their exquisitely tuned grazing patterns that led to the nourishment of, of the prairies for so long. Um, with all of my other co-speakers tonight having um, presented the slides and a lot of technical information, um, I would like to continue the journey through uh, a poetic process. Um, I've written climate and environmental poems throughout my life, and at each stage they represented what I was thinking and feeling at that time. Um, so the first uh, two that I'll share uh, date back to my pre-soil days, um, not really knowing what the future looked like, could any hope be found, and so forth. <clears throat> the first one dates to 1990. I had just read Bill McKibben's book, The End of Nature, which had come out the previous year. And uh, the, it was just before the Montreal Protocol was signed. For those of you who don't remember, that was to limit the, uh, the chlorofluorocarbons going into the atmosphere to protect the ozone layer. The poem is called Lament of the Green. The skin on my back should be brown, but it's red. This summer's tan is a burn instead. As UV levels climb to the roof, industry heads remain aloof. Less ozone fills the southern hemisphere. But what is that for us to fear? Traditionally, the South gets trashed for short-term gain and a big wad of cash. It's downright American to lend a helping hand while wreaking eco-havoc upon a foreign land. But foreign, <coughs> but foreign is passe. <coughs> We're all next door. Our third world sins now pound against our shore. Imperial flags are yet unfurled. Red, the blood of species no longer of this world. White, the fear of having tipped nature's scale too far. Blue, once the color of oceans, now covered with oil and tar. How far will things degenerate before we stop and see? There is a way to live with nature in peaceful harmony, to use the fruits of our knowledge and might to nourish and sustain, not for fear and blight. Yeah. Continuing along my hopeless phase, um, <laughs> my next poem, written in 2006, it's called Apocalypse Almost Now, or The Midnight Ride of the Valkyries. Listen, my earthmates, and you shall know how carbon emissions rapidly grow. Pipelines by land, tankers by sea, we on the rising shoreline shall be. From the beach, the view is clear. CO2's up, new climbs are here. Glaciers melt, oceans rise. Wrong temperature, pH, a coral reef dies. Studies agree, forecasts are dire. Cast out of Eden, into the fire. Then I began learning about soil, <clears throat> and um, my poetry took a turn, a turn for the more uh, hopeful and optimistic. <clears throat> this one written three years ago, it's called Climate Farming. So what's the future? Is there no hope? Healing the land can help us cope, and grow better food with less flooding too. But carbon in soil is what we must do. Draw down the heat, slow the sea rise, let birds and bees thrive in the skies. Good farming is how we deal with this mess. Now the climate's fixed, what's next to address? 
<laughs> Thank you. A little Ogden Nash like that as well. Um, and then I began uh, learning about Walter Yenny's work, and after attending his wonderful workshop uh, last year, I wrote a poem uh, called Moist. Mycorrhizal fungi, bacterial life unseen, soil carbon sponge, I wonder what that could mean. Caterpillar butterfly, total transformation, giving life back to the earth, genesis, creation. Infiltrate, condensate, hydrological cycle, Exudate is drawdown rate, growth, decay, recycle. Compost, fence post, grazing plan, which side gets more rain? Stop the drought and the flood, let's green this world again. Yeah. <laughs> On a personal note, growing up, I was a, very much a fan of John Denver, whose music helped me connect with. Um, my love and passion for nature and, and for the environment. <coughs> I learned uh, not too long ago that at the time of his death in, uh, in, two, in 1997, uh, John Denver was just beginning to learn about the need for planned grazing on a 1,000 acre nature preserve that he had bought where livestock had been excluded and consequently the biodiversity began to plummet. So, um, so I heard from Hunter Lovins, uh, some of you may know as co-founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, she was good friends with John Denver, that she was actually teaching him about this at the time of his, uh, of his passing. And I mention that because I attended a John Denver tribute concert in December, and I've been thinking about writing a poem about grazing, and as I began to rehear a lot of his old songs, I recalled that the main characters, or the, all the songs had a character. The songs weren't about grazing or, or about uh, a fish swimming. It was about the dolphin or about the eagle or the hawk or the stallion. Um, and so I realized my poem needed a hero, in that, you know, what better hero than the bison? So my poem is called, Oh Give Me a Home. <laughs> bison, once the vanquished, are heroes now again, creating better soil, capturing more rain, grazing nature's banquet, fed by shower and sun, keeping prairie healthy, as billions before have done. Grasses making syrup, exuded by leaky roots, transforming carbon in the air into fungi, worms, and shoots. Silent climate army, glory yet unsung, feeding the earth, growing new life with hoof and pea and dung. <laughs> Heading toward May 8th, for us that means that we're going to get together and figure out how we can plug in to all of the amazing things happening already in our communities and what new amazing things we need to get going because there are certainly a lot of them. We're not doing it all. We're not doing nearly enough, but we're doing a lot and we can do more. So I want to hear from all of you. What are you thinking about? Do you have a question that's been burning? You're not going to get an answer. But we are going to write that question down, and we've been tracking the questions and comments from these <coughs> sessions, and those are what is shaping how we are going to work on May 8th together. So what you say is actually incredibly important, not only to all the ears in this room, but into shaping the future of our work. Uh, so we're going to pass it around. Please also say who you are and where you're from. Henry Swayze, Tunbridge. And my question is, uh, how do we make the most change the fastest? Chris Wood, um, I want to add one thing. If if you want, if you're thinking you want to come on the eighth, can you indicate that as? Can you indicate that as well? Um, and I don't want to add any time. Hi, Cochran. I'm from West Hartford on a small farm. Uh, and I will be coming May 8th. I'm looking forward to May 8th. Uh, I have about 32 years experience uh, at a place called the Upper Valley Food Co-op, which not only uh, tries to uh, 
provide really good food for people, but also has a big education program. And that's actually one of the reasons that I've been there for so long, is this education program. Uh, it's in a, a, a point of kind of trying to figure out what it's going to be doing right now. And I have been pushing really strongly for it to be a center for some uh, information uh, and discussion on this very topic that we've been talking about for the last six sessions. Uh, and I don't know where that's going to go, but I'm really hoping that we're going to put something together so people can actually see things up in our big library room, but also uh, something online. So we'll see where it goes. <coughs> Sorry, that was important time. Um, I, hi, I'm Lauren. Uh, I am. I live in Jericho right now, um, and I think for me, what keeps coming up is just how interconnected all of these things are, and how interconnected climate change is with the way humans, Americans in particular, live their lives, and how it's just fundamentally broken. Hi, I'm Beth, and the first thing I have to say is hooray for Henry, because every time, point it at your mouth, don't hold it up. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're, you're. Yeah. okay, I'm saying hooray for Henry, thank you, Grace. Um, every time he's been using his little slogan about cooling, I thought, yeah, huh? But tonight, now I see he's actually talking about something that I couldn't understand. <laughs> I know, <laughs> the practice makes perfect. <laughs> so my big questions are, how do we connect with people who actually have land that they're taking care of that might want to do some of these things that we're talking about? And my perennial question, how do we get schools and teachers and school boards on board to let people like my grandkids learn enough to have the chance to get out in the summer and work for the benefit of the land and get the right to defend themselves? My name's Jessica Wright, and I live up the road in Braintree here. And um, this is actually the first first of this series that I've been able to come to. Um, and I, I don't have a question, or maybe I have too many questions, but what strikes me is how much I have to learn. And I really appreciate being able to, to come here and um, and the, clearly, there's a lot of work that's being done, and it needs to be done, too. And um, I appreciate what people are doing here. Uh, hi, my name is Nancy. I live down um, outside of Bellas Falls. And I've been to all of these except for one. And I've been out working my land the last couple of weeks. And <clears throat> I now have two little cat Buxtons on my shoulder. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> my snuffle hoe in one hand and my rake and my digger in the other and Kate cats yelling, roots in the ground on one shoulder and no soil left uncovered on the other shoulder. <laughs> I'm looking forward to May 8th. Yeah. Okay, because I need some help. All right. <laughs> David Ritchie Putney. Uh, I am so impressed with those four seven minute, uh, uh, I don't know what to call them, they're beautiful. They're, each one was so succinct and uh, I, I have to now try to read about everything that you all are talking about. I want to do everything I can in my work at uh, Green Mountain Spinnery to support the grazers. So this is so much uh, good information for me. And um, I also want to try to support the Navajo Nation because I go to their festival once a year. 
And if anyone uh, is really an expert on all this work in dry land, uh, I hope you'll come and talk to me so I can support them. Thank you. I am Art Shaler from Northview, uh, and uh, I live on a pretty big tract of forest land. And uh, it's painful to uh, uh, do forest management when uh, there's less green. Uh, and so my dilemma is, what's the time cycle uh, making a more healthy uh, uh, forest uh, landscape, uh, which will always contribute to more uh, cooling. Uh, and so it's that balance that I'm kind of interested in. And, and thanks for the poems. I thought they were bad. <laughs> My name is Karen Bixler. I live in East Bethel. And I just can't thank you enough to have for this series because, like you, I've got her on my back when I'm out starting to dig roots. Whoops! Maybe a better label. <laughs> my name is Lisa Lestory. I live in Bethel. And this is only my second one of these series that I've come to, but I, what I've been thinking of is how much wealth of information and experience we have here, and I'm looking forward to the next meeting where we can come up with ideas of what we can do collectively. But I also have a lot of young people that come to our farm to get engaged and to learn, and I'm not seeing them here. Like, I'm telling them about these meetings, and I'm not seeing them come. And I want to find out what does it take to put a fire under their butts to get them to, you know, it's one thing to have a quick conversation or to learn something fast from somebody on the ground. But it's another thing to actually invest and to dig, let those deep roots penetrate and slowly absorb stuff. And I'm finding, sometimes I'm finding that the generation that I'm interacting with a lot wants to just get it all right now or they don't have time. And, and maybe that's just me, but that's kind of what I'm sensing. And I want to find out how we can grab them and, and get them involved and have, give, them, give them the patience to, to uh, find out what they can do. My name is Jenny Christensen. Oh, Hold it like this. My name is Jenny Christensen, and we have a small organic gardening business. My passion is nurturing the community of the soil. And I am 100% yes, yes, yes to everything I hear tonight. And it's upbeat and it's encouraging, and I've been debating back and forth what I have to say. Maybe um, nothing at all, and just blow away like chat. But I. Um, Microphone? I heard that we should share our questions. And so there are things that I've been pondering and questioning, and I thank you for. Listening, it's, um, I think we need to, to, to jump ahead because what I have to share is a downer. But I think we need to keep on keeping on as long as we're able to keep on. I live under the open sky because that's where we do our work for most of the season. Spring, fall, the summer even parts of the winter, and I thought, this is, my grandmother taught me to always look at the sky. I always look at the sky. We are in a place where the sky is big. And for the past three years, I've been noticing jets leaving lines in parallel, in diagonal, perpendicular. I'm amazed at how many of my friends are oblivious, but then they don't live under the sky like I do. I don't know how many of you have observed. It's lessened now. It was much worse three years ago. I think they moved from place to place. But I noticed that the sky in the morning to the southeast usually has cloud banks, not always, but as a rule. And in the evening, there are cloud banks. I notice not so much now, but over the past three years, many, many jets leaving plumes 
that then broaden and melt into clouds. I noticed cloud shapes that I've never noticed before. I don't know how many of you are aware of these things, but I ponder why. I also have noticed something different in the sky as well, where I'll see the light of the sun behind these cloud banks, and the light will be here and the light will be there. And I think, okay, so the clouds are thinner here, they're thicker here, and then they're thinner here, so I see light here and I see light here. But I haven't noticed that in the past, and it may be because of the cloud banks and the artificial clouds, and I wonder why. In the past two summers, in the afternoons, I notice a quality to the sun that is very burning. I've been out in the open for summers decades. I'm in my 60s now, so that's five decades. And it's unique. It's unique. And I expect the intensity of the sun will be great this summer as well. On Saturday morning, March 9th, I lifted the shade in our kitchen, which faces due east. And it just so happened that the sun was in its place where there were no trees, so that I could see a perfect, clear sunrise, and it was a a, a, a uniquely clear morning. And I love to watch the sunrise. I love to watch the sunset. I love to watch the sky. And I saw the first sliver of the sun coming up to the left of the window frame as I pulled up the shade. And I stood there to watch it because it's sublime and it's majestic and it's powerful. And then when I was watching it rise ever so slowly, there was a second orb that rose to the left of it, just a thin little sliver. And so then as the sun rose higher, I blocked it with the window frame and watched this second orb rise until it became too bright and it was over. But I gazed at it at length over several minutes. And I wonder why, and I wonder what. And I wonder, I wonder, and I'm just a foolish old woman, I suppose, and I could just be breathing a lot of nonsense. But could it be that all those artificial clouds are to buffer? to hide? Could it be that ancient prophecies of a time of distress coming on the entire world, a day coming when no man can work, the earth being consumed by fire, all of these ancient prophecies, could there be a connection? So I'm full of pondering and I'm full of wondering. Hi, um, I'm Tammy Jo, and I know I talk about my grandchildren all the time, but they're key, I think. Um, I don't know a lot of like, teenage kids and stuff, but I spend a lot of time with my grandchildren and talking to teach them everything I learned, and I'm hoping to work with people to learn um, what I can do and learn more to teach my grandchildren that are coming up through and anybody else I come in contact that's interest in contact with that's interested in how to save ourselves basically. So um, yeah, so if anybody has anything that I can help them with, I would like to volunteer my my time initially. Um, to learn what I can do. So. This is Carlotta, I'm a player. Um, I think what's on my mind right now is uh, I want to flip the 
barriers between knowledge and systems that are continuing in the way that they have been working for a very long time. And <clears throat> what the barriers are between those two things and how they can be broken down and overcome. I'm Bill Chitzy, uh, currently in Berlin. And my question is, where are young people tonight and every night? I invited some myself tonight. They did return my invitation, but I'm asking, where are they now? Each of us has young people we can invite <coughs> or we can go to if they don't want to come to us. Maybe that will work. I participated in Grange now 60 years. The Grangers are not for long. Yeah. <laughs> they have very good intentions and amazing systems of including young people for over 100 years. And I do think that we can do it. My name is Nancy Rice from Randolph Center. I've only made a couple of these, but um, it gives me hope to see so many people caring about the land and nature, and so, um, and working together. My name is Mike Bald, uh, Royalton. I guess my question is, why would you give me the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> um, not to make light of it. Um, I wake up. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to honor the 30 seconds. I, I wake up every day with a new question. Um, and first of all, I feel gratitude for waking up every day. Um, there's good people here. Uh, that's, I'm echoing what other people have said. What a great group. Um, and the generosity is here. You, you can feel it. Um, I can tell you young people today are looking, they're just they're looking for role models. And there are not nearly the number of role models that there need to be. Um, that's that's where it starts. Um, so it's on all of us to seek to continue to provide that. Um, I guess my big question is, uh, why do we live in the Stone Age? Uh, why do we continue living in the Stone Age? Why are we looking for water on Mars? We have plenty of water here, um, and it's got issues. Um, the Stone Age example, I'll, I'll give you, the Stone Age question, I'll give you an example. Um, <coughs> Social Security from the 1930s, Farm Bill from the 1930s, we're approaching the 2030s and we're still living in the 1930s. Um, I've never enjoyed fiddleheads, I've never been a, a fan of fiddleheads, but this came from just down the street, a lovely batch of Japanese knotweed that would make a lovely, I don't know if Sarah's here from the Black Crim, but if she comes in, we'll obviously we'll give her a round of applause. But this is the time of year that everyone enjoys fiddleheads, and I've been asking for a couple of years, you're all, everyone's so frustrated with Japanese knotweed, why don't you just stop whacking the fiddlehead ostrich ferns and start eating knotweed and garlic mustard? Because you know what comes in after the ostrich ferns are gone, so that's edible, and it's got resveratrol and all kinds of good stuff in it. But no, we stick with our tradition. Uh, we, need to, we need to wake up and move, to turn, a, turn a page. Um, I think I should stop there. Um, <laughs> uh, my, point, my point is, I heard today, I was at the Pesticide Advisory Council meeting today, the only member of the public that was there. No legislators were there either, nor have legislators ever been to the Pesticide Advisory Council meeting. But I did ask them, um, I did hear several times, knowledge, you know, I'm not going to mention the parties. Everyone's trying to get the word out, get the knowledge out. And someone said here, you know, sharing knowledge is great. My question every day is, we're, yeah, knowledge is great, but knowledge is also power, and power drives people to do some interesting things. So I question knowledge every day. And the stuff I heard today was not knowledge. It was garbage. And I'm not going to go into it, but um, we need to really proof the knowledge every day and further what people have asked you, what can I do to, to make it a better place? With that, Jael. Um, my name is Jael. I live in Worcester. Um, 
So we need to take the show on the road, um, and that's how we will get more young people. We need to go to them. A lot of young people do not own cars, and it's hard for them to get places. So take this up to UVM, take it down to Bennington College, um, and take it to the State House. Um, but what's been on my mind is um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a vegetable grower. And um, I feel a lot of solidarity with subsistence farmers around the world. And what drives, I guess, my motivation is um, how much those subsistence farmers are going to suffer because of climate change. And um, I feel so fortunate living in Vermont and farming in Vermont. And um, I feel like the knowledge in this room, like if this knowledge was, if world leaders um, had this knowledge, that um, there'd be a lot more peace in the world. My name's Brent Beidler, and uh, my wife and I have a farm right here in Randolph. Um, we were dairy farming for many years, and now we, um, we're still grazing. But we just don't have lactating cows. And have very much uh, lived the, um, a lot of the principles that are talked about with the benefits of, of intensive grazing and watch soil building and water holding capacity on our farm in real terms and really am hoping uh, to find ways of better being able to communicate that to um, really the young people I think is where I'm looking and wanting to have ways of more constructive dialogue because around climate there's such um, so many strong opinions but the people that really farm the land, that have the have it in their hands, um, have very different approaches. But they're not all um, not all people are going to be grazing nuts like me. But and we want to grow some other things other than um, just um, livestock. So we're going to have to find ways to really have constructive conversations about how how um, different approaches can be had for that. And uh, I struggle with that because um, most of the farming community um, sees that there's a, a situation that they need help with, but um, don't necessarily have um, clear paths towards it. Water is really a key to this conversation because that's where we can visually see things in our community. Um, water rainfall simulations, where you can watch um, the water holding capacity in, in with our own eyes, and uh, so I'm very appreciative of this series. This is the first one I've attended, but I really have appreciated it tonight. Hi, I'm Lynn Wild from Montpelier. Um, I want to thank the two people that rode up with me today from Montpelier, the two young people. Um, they might not consider themselves young people, but they're at least 30 years younger than I am, so uh, thank you. Um, in addition to working with the tree board in Montpelier, which I've been doing for about four years, uh, I also have about eight hundredths of an acre of land inside the city of Montpelier, and most of it's covered by my house. But the part that's not covered by my house is now covered by blueberries and raspberries and asparagus and um, 30 hazelnut trees, a cottonwood tree. Uh, floral raspberries, uh, lingonberries, cranberries, and I have been fighting the battle every spring with my husband not to rake the leaves away. <laughs> and um, my question is, how can I work my, with my neighbors in town to keep the leaves on the ground rather than putting them in a plastic bag and sending them off to the stump dump? If you've got the answer to that question, you can talk all night. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charles Williamson. Um, I'm from Darlington, South Carolina, but I'm working for uh, uh, Luna Blue up in uh, South Royalton. It's really a uh, great introduction to New England for sure. Um, I, I really wholeheartedly agree with the role models point that was made. Uh, my role model is you know, Judith Schwartz and uh, you just give them uh, for young people that you know that you want to 
bring to, I don't want to speak for like an entire generation or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> uh, what it helped me was definitely having role models. And I think that's very powerful. Uh, folks like Judith, folks like Alan Savory and Peter Donovan, folks like that who are out there, you know, with a passion. Um, and y'all were talking about how it's hard to convince uh, younger folks to uh, to realize a passion and discover these really important issues of water retention and erosion. But I'm also, I'm wondering what methods have y'all found effective with addressing those issues with older generation farmers who do care about water and do care about the soil quality but do not want to change methods. <coughs> Tony Keller from Braintree. Uh, question is, how can local farming and local consumption be accelerated in our communities? I'm Robin Russell. Um, I'm sorry to have arrived late. I really wanted to hear Henry speak. I, when I first came to Vermont, um, I bought an old farm up in Tunbridge, and Henry was doing um, rotational grazing. And I learned a lot about rotational grazing and um, the connection of land and culture. Um, so I guess my question, um, to the point of, of, of you know, in the context of a changing climate, various <coughs> threats against us um, that we're that we're all facing. In the bigger in the bigger picture, how do we keep heart? How do we transition together? How do and what can we learn from the soil? From, the, from nature, from the patterns in nature. Um, I do a lot of traditional dance and music and have learned a lot about the patterns from those traditions um, that, that mimic um, the growing of things or the branching or the, the, the various patterns. So it, it, the range, yes, um, there's knowledge being lost very rapidly and not being transferred <coughs> to new people, but I guess my question would be, um, through, through this connection of, of, of our hearts and our minds, can we, is there a way that maybe we do communicate this knowledge and pass it on in a way that, that organisms in, in nature do and we don't quite understand? And maybe we just, maybe we won't understand, but that there's hope that it can happen. Hi, my name is Rick Gottesman. I uh, live in East Bethel. I'm uh, one of four people who are this uh, spring beginning a small community, small houses. And one of the things that we're talking about is um, in the future, right? Uh, we're about to put in our first garden. It's just to get us started. But in the future, we were um, thinking about how can we use a lot of work the land and bring animals to the land and, and what can we grow. And you know, so we're talking about a permaculture plan and et cetera. And so this um, group right here and the, the idea of soil has given me another um, dimension to, to think about. So when we start thinking about what is the next step, this is a resource now that I can tap into, and there's a lot of experienced people around here in uh, animal husbandry and, and growing different uh, crops and whatnot that we can use. And we want to make this available, this, this land, which is about 40 acres, available to young people. It's sort of like a laboratory, and uh, that's the, um, uh, the partnership between the generations. You know, the, most young people don't have land to, to experiment on and learn. And, and they're looking for uh, places. So we want to make it available. And um, this is certainly a great resource for, for all of us. Um, my, name is Steve, <coughs> my name is Stephen Marks, and I'm, I live in Stratford. And um, I guess my question would be, um, how can we um, 
get um, people to understand that taking care of the earth is a spiritual journey and that it's our journey, um, that we are all spiritual beings and what we have to do is take care of this earth. <coughs> My name is Tate, I'm from South Stratford. Um, I guess, I don't know if I have this specific <coughs> question right now. Uh, obviously a million and one different concerns. Um, lately I've been thinking about bank erosion as the river behind my apartment is washing away. Um, but um, I guess also trying to find some sanity in, in the process, thinking about what is what is natural and what is unnatural. And, um, uh, and I think trying to hold on to a little bit of faith that there is a bigger system that maybe will help do the work that we're, we think that we're just responsible for. So uh, knowing that like nature has this incredible ability to balance itself out when there are times when it becomes unbalanced. So um, I don't know, just think, trying to think differently about plants and species and stuff like recognizing that uh, hemlocks are stressed out right now. Um, ash trees are stressed out right now and that seems so unfortunate and then we have all of these invasives but maybe trying to think differently about invasives like eating the knotweed or something um, because if there are plants that are not going to be able to survive in the future climates like we will still need plants so how do we work with things that seemingly are problematic or what really is a problem uh, and I guess just being able to adapt. Uh, my name is Keith Walsh. I live in Bedford. Uh, I am the uh, vacation mystic, the very, very lucky and blessed winner to just go home with a lot of knowledge. And, uh, and I've been feeling that way too, from all of the events that I've been coming to here. Uh, and even all of the information that comes through um, the copious amounts of emails. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm a wiser person every single day. So thank you all for everybody who contributes in that way, uh, and especially to the authors that, uh, that I'm soon to learn even more from. Um, I, my question uh, is, is one of well, quite a few, uh, but really thinking in terms of what plant are we hearing most about in terms of the general public these days, and it's the cannabis plant. And we are, and this is on the news almost every single day, it seems, when I watch the news, which is maybe biannually. So, uh, the, uh, I think that there is a way for us to utilize this coming cultivation of a new cash crop to not only help support uh, our farmers, but to bioremediate our lands. Uh, to bioremediate ourselves with the medicine that comes from this plant, uh, the animals by using it uh, as feed for the animals, uh, building materials, fiber, new products, new industry. Um, the Fairbanks up in St. Johnsbury became famous uh, for a scale that they invented to put their hemp on the train. So let's keep in mind what's been done in this state in terms of uh, utilizing that plant uh, not only as a profit center, uh, but also as a way for us to all reach homeostasis. Um, so how do, how do we help integrate this regenerative practice into this coming industry? And how do we help take advantage of uh, the continued conversation around agriculture and helping to put the regenerative narrative into that through our uh, public media sources? I just want to pipe in and say it's 8.30, which is our official <coughs> end time, so we wouldn't be offended if people want to leave, but we sure hope you'll stay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jesse Markson. I'm starting a small mushroom farm, looking to create a no-waste mushroom farm and integrating it into perennial agricultural systems. Very, uh, very glad that this series has been hosted, I've learned a lot more about mutational grazing and, and soil health. Um, and even though I've known for a long time and feel like a lot of people in my age group um, have known for a long time that it's, there are a lot of problems, I think a big issue is just 
the getting past the stagnation point of, of um, feeling like it's too big and it's kind of like it's denial, 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 and then okay, it's now too late. And I think uh, I have some just some curiosity of what other people's thoughts are on um, how to slow down while speeding up, like how to slow down and let people have time to really absorb the enormity of the information that we that it's taken me and I'm sure many other people resonate with. You know, it takes time to absorb all of this different biochemical interactions in our Earth and this biosphere and all like every single element of our day-to-day -day lives <laughs> is going to change whether we want it to or not. But how do we do this intentionally and learn intentionally to so slow down and allow that, that time and space to do that in a comfortable way, but also <laughs> flip the paradigm in a quick way so we actually have a, a little more climate to work with. Um, I'm not sure if that's a clear question, but i just like to talk to people more about that in the future. Hi, I'm Sandy Gamur. I'm from Heartland. Uh, I live at Cobb Hill Co-Housing. Um, I've come to a few of these, not all of them, but I so appreciate that it's been a series and not just a one-off, one-day workshop because, like you were saying, it takes time to absorb all this information and it's... Um, yeah, it's just helped me to think about it more on a daily basis, having the series um, and all the notes that come through. And um, I, I just wanted to mention something. I was a volunteer at uh, Flavors of the Valley. I don't know how any of you go to that this year by chance. Um, well, I was helping, and I ended up being um, kind of guarding the back door. and. Um, I found myself between a water table that was set up, uh, I can't remember exactly who it was, but I think it was Windsor Public Works or something like that. And on the other side of me was a soil tunnel for the kids. Um, and it was this setup of um, a, a kind of a, a, a thing that was set up about four feet or so high and the, I had, there were little flashlights there the kids would take and go in and they could see what the soil looked like underneath. There were things on the, the draped walls of this structure. So I'm helping the kids you know, go through that. And some kids did it over and over again. They just loved it. <laughs> and, um, and then on the other side, I'm listening to the Public Works guys and watching people fascinated by their table where they had, um, it wasn't sand, it was um, uh, little tiny pieces of plastic <laughs> that are made like sand and the water is, you know, running through and they had little buildings and culverts and bridges and things. But I realized as I was watching and listening, no plants really. And I think they were mostly talking about these the infrastructure pieces and how you go about doing that to control and move water and i thought to myself oh gosh then we have to you know get some information to these people and then um, so that they're sharing how to you know build up the plant the vegetation around waterways and I, it just, it, and it was just so striking being in between these two things and <coughs> wanting to pull them together somehow. So mm -hmm. I hope to do that. I've, okay. Also, I've just started volunteering at the Heartland Elementary School for the, their garden, helping teachers do planting things with their students. And they, the teachers need so much help to have school gardens functioning at their schools, and they don't have much time. So if any of us have time to offer, I think that's a great place to reach out to the youth coming along. And they get so excited by you know, what we're doing with them and help them plant seeds and harvest stuff. So thank you. I'm Nicole Conti from Barner, Vermont. This is only the second time I've been at this series, but uh, I'm going to watch all the other ones because you've been videotaping them, so thank you for that. And uh, 
Uh, I just want to say thank you to all the farmers in the room because I love to eat and I appreciate all the local food in Vermont and I think it's so awesome that all of you work so hard and care so much about what you care about. And I'm not saying I don't care about it, but I, I just, I don't picture myself doing your job. So just thank you. <laughs> And then thank you for the series, and thanks for everybody sharing their sadness and their, as well as their hope and their big questions and their intellect. It's just really great. Um, and I, my big question is, how do we, how does a one person and then a group of people, if you're working together, how do you stay focused? What do you focus on? Because there's so much. And I found one thing that I can maybe offer is on Wednesday, May 1st, is the Vermont Youth Lobby's Rally <coughs> for the Planet. And the slogan is Climate Jobs Justice. So on this Wednesday, coming up, there will be school kids from all over Vermont. Because my daughter just told me today, can I go on this field trip? I was kind of shocked. She's usually not interested in this stuff. So she's 15, and her school is taking a group to the state house. And it's from <coughs> 9 to 1.30 on May 1st and they want adults to show up that's part of it and I'm sure a lot half of you probably heard about it but maybe my question is how how do we show up what do we listen for how can it answer some of the questions that people were throwing out about youth today oh. <laughs> my name is Carolyn Agley and uh, I have a farm in Braintree and uh, I've been um, raising um, Hereford cows and doing intensive grazing with them and it has brought the land back tremendously mm. in a short amount of time um, with some inputs but the, um, the, the effect of um, the smaller pastures and the, the more uh, the moving them more frequently has made, made a huge impact on on the land. <clears throat> I do think that um, that um, farmers are worried about doing something like that because it's more input and it's more uh, seemingly more work but actually it's it's really not so much work once you get the all the infrastructure in place. Um, I don't know that I have a question so much as I have a declaration, and that is that every day I choose to be grateful for what is, and then I, when I do that, I tend to see more possibilities uh, for everything in the future and and um, and at that moment. Um, I do think that, like the the coming back of the land with the with the simple thing of moving the cows more often, that there are, and that the soil actually sequesters carbon, and that there's a lot of, you know, as I wasn't here for the whole thing, but I did, I do know that um, it can, that pasture land can be as important for sequestering carbon as a forest. If the land is in, if the soil is in good enough condition, so it seems that the soil is everything. And um, I'm so happy that there's so much interest here in this. I didn't know about this series. I don't tend to read the paper. That's really what happens. So anyway, I'm grateful that this is taking place. And um, <coughs> thank you very much. What's the name of your farm? Old Brainstorm Farm. <laughs> it's old brick house. On the big pond. Yeah. Thank you. You took some of the words out of my mouth. I'm I'm Jerry Ward. I live in Randolph Center. I am not a farmer. I'm not going to burden the group with another question. Because frankly, the questions are kind of oppressive in how big they are, and how hard they are to answer. And that's kind of the message. The feeling I'm getting is that the, these interactions we're learning about the big cycles with water, soil, and the air, and 
how they're all so intertwined is really so big that I think that has something to do with why the youth aren't coming. They, they want simpler, more digestible ways of looking at the world. That's, that's part of our challenge, as I see it, is to make it um, where, the, where they just have to learn the hard way. And one other problem I see that is um, maybe more my issue than others, because other people seem to stop talking about it as population. I just can't think about air, soil, or water without thinking about population as maybe the, at least on a par, if not the fundamental factor that's behind all of them. I don't know what to do about it, but um, as far as how you go on and find hope in the midst of all this, for, my, for me personally, a lot of my strategy is keeping my local connections buying as much locally, trying to produce as much locally as we can, and appreciating groups like this that are getting the kind of connections that I think is where I find hope. And as I'd like to reiterate what Stephen Marks just said about never forgetting our, with reverence, our spiritual place in this earth. My name is Abby Miling, and I live in Randolph Center. And I, I don't have a question as much as a reaction also, but in Jesse, I got it right? Yes, I resonated a lot with what you said, and um, that's where I'd like to put my energy. Thank you. My name is Jason Van Dreich. I'm from Burlington. And I've been thinking a lot about how crazy it is and how amazing uh, the way that tiny little Vermont has been a leader and a catalyst for the country as a whole on, on so many issues. And this came to mind most recently reading an article about the 10th anniversary of the marriage equality bill, um, which opened up the floodgates nationwide. And in that context, the question that I'm thinking about is what would it take to pass here in Vermont a Vermont Green New Deal that's grounded in soils and agriculture in the next two years. Because we sure as hell know there isn't going to be a Green New Deal in the next two years <coughs> nationally. But boy, we might be able to pave the way. Wow. 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 I would like to mention, particularly to the farmers in the room and the ones who are raising sheep, um, there's a conference coming up this weekend at Dartmouth. It's a free two-day conference on Friday and Saturday called Cows, Land, and Labor, uh, looking at the important role of livestock in human health, environmental health, and local economy. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the food and soil activist, Vandana Shiva, uh, who's written about a dozen books or so, uh, is going to be here in Vermont She's going to be at the State House in Montpelier uh, next Monday, May 6th, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, so that'll be an opportunity to hear her speak and to meet her and to learn from her work if you're available. Hi, I'm Josie Carruthers. I live in East Randolph. Um, we slipped in a little late because we were finishing uh, the um, Randolph Region Revitalized uh, presentation on uh, uh, the task forces that emerged from uh, uh, here in Randolph as a result of Randolph's earning a uh, participation in a program called the Model Climate Community, um, where uh, a year ago, uh, I guess four task forces were formed in order to work and work on getting Randolph uh, positioned for the what what has been called the greatest uh, economic opportunity in human history, um, and that is to construct the climate economy, uh, an economy of resilience uh, and and positive action in response to climate change. Um, so. Uh, 
you know, would that everybody working in the R3 uh, could understand the potential that we have uh, in this state for, uh, uh, and, and, and of course to replicate <coughs> elsewhere um, in the country uh, with the soil and water knowledge. Uh, this series has been powerful for me. I've been to most of them. Um, and so there's a guy named Paul Costello who heads up the, the Council for Rural, the Vermont Council for Rural Development. Um, and um, he's a profound guy. Uh, he's an he's a, a extraordinary, uh, surprisingly enlightened being. <laughs> um, and he gave us brief talk at the end, and he said, um, a lot of young people are so full of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the games that are marketed to them, like worldwide apocalyptic video games are the mm -hmm. highest selling video games. Um, and people's talk about uh, People's doomsday talk. You have 20 years left. You have 10 years left. Da, 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 all these things. He said, "Would that the adults would find a way to talk to and around the young people with?" And the, the words he used were, um, "Let me just see. Uh, it was with confidence." creativity, and engagement. We have in this room, for example, the wherewithal to, uh, to have some confidence, even, even if we don't make it. And this is one of the things, one of the great things in the Dancing with a Cannibal Giant film that Bale made. Um, uh, let's, we, we all do this work. We all embrace this. We, we, uh, to the best of our ability, decide to have this confidence and this creativity. Um, hey, maybe we don't make it. Maybe we do. But the quality of our lives and the inspiration that we are sharing and spreading by our presences is extraordinary. And so we can do this. We can, we can do this. I think. Uh, uh, Chris and Kat and everybody that's put this on has very carefully constructed programs with information to enable us to be the role models that, we were, that we've been talking about. Everybody, all of us, has the ability to do that. Um, so uh, rather than a question that's like a declaration uh, that <laughs> um, certainly I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it to, uh, to the best I can to be a role model to talk with creativity, confidence, and engagement around young people, to remember that uh, climate change, while, yes, the largest crisis that humanity has yet faced, uh, doesn't mean it's insoluble. We know that. So I encourage us, when we get together on May 8th, to, to remember those words and maybe make our own vows and declarations of how we can actually be effective. So I've been listening to everybody, and it's all so valuable trying to think how I could possibly add to all this, um, except by saying that the spiritual aspects of our existence have been coming to the fore. And one question that's always been in my mind as a volunteer after Hurricane Irene struck here um, I was out there doing what I could, and so were thousands of other people. And the sense of unity and love and caring that are exhibited when a disaster strikes, it just shows you what's underneath people's everyday demeanor. And perhaps a group like this can, my question is, how do we tap into that, that, that underlying goodness in the human race where we want to be together, we want to be as one, we want to be working towards a, I, I was thinking about the, the whole, uh, I love thinking about words, community, it just means with unity. And that's, 
Vermont really is making it. I just want to mention before I give this up that last uh, a year or two ago, um, Michael Krupp took over in Slovakia, sent me a, a link to a newspaper over there in Slovakia. Some of you probably don't even know where that is, but it's <laughs> okay. Well, their their cover story was on Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> It was this big, long story about how Burlington was leading the, the world in sustainability for a city. So don't think that little Vermont can't make an impact. So uh, I'm Tony E. Pryle. Uh, I'm married to Judy Schwartz. And among other ways that I'm lucky, I also get to travel with her and photograph um, interesting people. Uh, I just want to make one observation from my own background. Um, I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, grew up there, and when I was in my early teens, the family moved to London, and uh, London has a bank of clouds over it pretty much all the time, and to me it seemed like it rained all the time in London, uh, and I missed the 300 and 50 plus days of sunshine a year in Johannesburg. So I was surprised when I learned that um, Johannesburg actually has a slightly higher annual rainfall than London does. And yeah, the big difference is it all comes down in about three and a half weeks in summer, in December. Uh, every afternoon around four, the clouds build up, a tremendous thunderstorm, and the rain comes down. Um, something that's changed in Johannesburg since I was a child, there were always a lot of trees, and um, the trees are much taller, and Johannesburg is known as the largest urban rainforest, the largest urban forest in the world. Uh, Rio also has been given that distinction, so they can argue about it. But <laughs> the climate has changed in Johannesburg since my childhood. And there are quite a number of birds that have come in simply because the trees have gotten bigger, there's more canopy, there's more shade. Um, it's uh, cooled off a little, but mostly it's, um, it's more regulated by this uh, canopy of trees. Um, what this suggests to me a number of things since we're talking about water today is that we often talk about how much water falls, but what really matters is where the water falls, how often it falls, and what happens to it when it lands. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, part of the topic of, of Judy's book, Water in Plain Sight. But it's an issue we all need to think about because water is vital to our lives, and what we do on the land and with soil uh, really is directly related to to the issues of climate and how water, climate, and the, uh, the presence of drinkable water is possible. Thank you. Um, I'm Judy, and I'm glad that I can actually answer a question. So um, someone, someone posed the possibility of having, um, I guess, I think he called it a Green New Deal in Vermont, but focused on soil. So. Um, a colleague of, of mine, um, actually someone I'm writing a chapter about in my new book, um, Jeff Goebel, it, uh, worked with people in New Mexico and they have, I mean, it's, it's passed. It's a, it's a soil health. It's soil health legislation based on those principles. And Dee Dee Pursehouse is giving a, an online class for people interested in working on legislation and getting such a bill passed in their states. I don't remember when it, it, it would be on her website, I think. It's Monday the 29th, I think. I will make sure it goes out. Okay. If, you, if you sign up, you'll get it. OK, and I just think that's a great opportunity because um, Jeff has this consensus model of working towards working with people, getting people to agree on, well, to see that they all want the same things and have to get there. And I, I 
heard about this process every step of the way. So anyway, if it can happen in New Mexico, it can happen here for sure. Although they've had a lot of water problems and I think that that, that really, um, you know, <laughs> raised the stakes. I'm uh, Mark Kelly. I, I moved to East Randolph about 10 years ago, and one morning I went down to the store and there were cookies everywhere. There were cookies on the shelves, there were cookies next to the register, there were cookies on, on the shelves with the automotive equipment. Um, they were just all over the place. And I asked the, asked the woman at the cash register, what's with all the cookies? Sure. Well, Linny was going right at it this morning. And I figured that Linny must have just got carried away with those cookies, but what, what it says to us, and in that spirit, uh, Josie and I have changed the approach we're taking to our small farm. Um, we are this year uh, basically doing away with the tiller. We are mulching everything. Uh, I've, I've been putting mycorrhizal spores in, the, in all of the uh, seedlings. Um, we are, um, we planted uh, barley in the fall and clover in the spring as cover crops, and so we're, we're going right at it. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for everybody for who's hanging in there. I'm Grace Gershuni. I live in Barnet uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. I'm very grateful to be part of this wonderful coalition with all of these great folks. And um, I'm kind of fading out, but I had a few comments like, I'm so impressed by everybody's ability to do exactly seven minutes and be really clear and succinct. I'm, I've got a role model here. For, for you all, and um, I try, have tried to be a role model all my life, and uh, uh, I would love to get Dancing with the Cannibal Giant in St. Johnsbury. Yes. Um, and I, on a, you know, I, I'm really glad for the fellow who won the books, and three of them are mine, and <laughs> I think they're already signed, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, this is what my life has been about, and at this point, you know, in my life, I'm really hoping to do more to share in a more direct way. I, I live in paradise. I need young people to share the work and the land where I live, so you no know, young people looking for a place to be, and uh, tell them, send them my way. <laughs> um, I'm Jane Woodhouse. This is my first night here. Um, I live in Peachum. I came with Grace and, and Beth. and. Um, I live on a piece of land, it's about 35 acres, with, with a raging brook going right through the middle of it, or actually right up close to the house. So I sort of have a reverence for this. I love this brook, but it can get pretty scary at times, yet it's never taken out the house. I raise um, goats and, and sheep there. I have anywhere from 10 to 20 animals. I have very little open land. Most of my land is a wooded hill across the brook, but I graze the animals on various pastures in the neighbor. I, I mean, it's a rural road uh, with lots of land, but on the neighbor's land, and everybody's used to, for 20 years, I've walked those animals down the road. And it used to be quite disastrous because they would go every direction. But now everybody that I have has been born on that property. And so they learn from their mothers, and they actually stand at the end of the driveway, the goats do till I get up there ahead of them and walk them down the road, which is really interesting, because they used to just keep going down the road. And they'll turn, they know to turn where the electronet is across the road. Um, I'm particularly interested in local textiles. I'm one of the directors of the Vermont Sheep and Wool Festival. Um, I've had fiber processed by David, 
and Green Mountain Spinnery does a wonderful job um, with their environmental practices. Uh, I think large-scale textiles uh, do a lot of damage to the land and the soil, to workers, the, the whole nine yards. Um, and we even did a, a panel discussion, it was like 12 years ago, I think, here in Randolph at the NOFA, when NOFA uh, conference was still here on local fiber shed before that word kind of got to be the N word. It was, and we talked about local things that were going on in this state or in the region. And at that time, all we could talk about was being able to get local wool or animal um, fiber. And now there's a possibility of hemp. And in, just down in Western Massachusetts, there's a whole project focused on flax. And they may be able to get, I, I think there's, uh, they're working toward getting flax processing equipment down there, which means we could get most of our fiber for a year's worth of clothing out of the north, out of the northeast. Mm -hmm. I work, my regular work is, or pay, is odd jobs, but I do a lot of weaving uh, for people that have animals and, and produce fiber and they have their yarn made and they bring it to me and I weave products that they then sell at the farmer's market or craft fairs and stuff. So I'm, I'm particularly interested, I mean water is a, is a key part of it. I mean how things are dyed, how things are cleaned, mm -hmm. um, and how animals are tended on that, on that land. I would also offer up that at the Wolf Festival, we allow nonprofits to, to have a table for like next to nothing. And it doesn't have to be related to the sheep and wool. I mean, it could, anything that has to do with agriculture in Vermont is, <clears throat> we'd love to have people come. So if, you are, if, if anybody is interested, the Wool Festival happened the first weekend in October in Tunbridge at the fairgrounds. Yeah, thanks. I've always wanted to go. Oh, you should come. It's fun. I play in a band yeah. called Wool. Oh, in really? Oh, uh, really? <laughs> we dream about playing there someday. Well, you should talk to the community yeah, radio yeah. station because they do all the entertainment, the Royalton. I know some people station. at the community radio station. <laughs> Um, so thank you all so much. Um, I guess I should also share my, my statement or question. Chris, sure. you might want to as well, huh? No, I passed. Oh, you passed. Okay. But I um, want to do a reminder on the eighth. Well, that my question was going to be, how do we get lots of people to come on May eighth? And that's just one day. So the intention is that we need to stay connected. We live in a community together. We have so many skills. And if you all could meet the two or 300 people that have come to these events total. Um, Just over 300. Yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, wow. it's, I mean, it's amazing. For this series? For the six. For this series. Many, everybody, of course, some people yeah. came up for all of them, but it just, just over 300 people. Wow counting the 50 that are here tonight. All on Wednesday nights, all between 7 and 9 p.m., two snowstorms. We still managed to get that many people. We did get a number of young people, but I realize there are definitely challenges. Randolph isn't around the corner from a lot of places, uh, transportation, et cetera. We've got to keep doing this. I'd love to take this around the state. I'd love to bring in um, the talented people from communities all over the state. It doesn't have to be the same people. I think one of the things we're realizing is that we are the ones we've been waiting for. We have everything we need, and we need each other. We need everyone who's not in this room. We need everyone who's in this room, and we can do this. We can build the resilient future that we need. We are the parts of the social mycelium that will hold our communities together. I just know that we can do it. The fact that you all keep coming shows me that we can do this. And I hope you'll come on May 8th. And if you can't come on May 8th, I hope you'll give us your email so that we can continue to let you know when things are going on um, and we can connect with your groups. That's another thing is that we really want to know every neighborhood group, everything that's going on. We want to be able to plug people in to the place where they feel comfortable and maybe where they feel a little uncomfortable too. <laughs> because we have to get uncomfortable if we're going to fix this mess. Thank you all so much. This has been a really amazing experience.